So in this series, we're looking at how we can have an impact or an influence for Jesus Christ. And the key scripture that we're using for this entire series comes from Matthew 5, where Jesus said, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your Heavenly Father. So last week we said that we had to start with the foundation of our beliefs, because if we get the foundation wrong, then everything else we do is going to be wrong. We need to make sure that our beliefs are based on the Word of God. The right beliefs will always lead to the right actions. We need to read and apply God's Word to our lives, So if you didn't pick up a Bible reading plan last week, we have them at the back table. You can pick one up. It's great to just saturate your mind with the Word of God because that's the foundation that we always operate from. So now I want you to think for a minute, what happens at your house when the electricity goes out and you don't have any lights? All right? Picture that. I know it's happened to you. It's happened to me. What happens at your house when you lose power? It can be frustrating when you're stumbling around in the dark trying to find a flashlight. And it's great when you finally find a flashlight, and it's even better if the batteries aren't dead, right? (laughs) Yeah. You can be the hero of the family if you know where to find a working flashlight. You shine the light for everyone else in the house so they're not stumbling around. You're the hero. You just say, hey, what do you need? Where do you need the light? Let me help And you shine it and you help out everybody in the house. But you know the other option you have? Is that you can get real annoying with how you shine the flashlight. (laughs) What happens if you decide to pick on another family member (laughs) and just shine the light in their face the whole time? Um, (laughs) What happens if you do that? I mean, you know, it just get irritating. They just do it over and over and over, and you just say, "Come on, nothing is out of here, right?" That's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah, and you know, sometimes you. Yeah, well, but sometimes there's even a blast. (laughs) (laughs) So it's like, oh, you just get so irritated, can't it? Absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) Or what happens if it's dark in the house, and then you just decide to turn off the flashlight? and laugh as everybody else stumbles around again. They can't find their way. You control the light, but you're not going to shine it. (laughs) You know, as followers of Jesus, I think we need to be thinking about the best ways to shine the light of Jesus into our dark world. I think if we're honest, sometimes Christians can get real annoying with the way they handle the light. Real annoying with the way they try to shine the light. Some Christians are pretty good at being judgmental as they watch the other people stumble around in the darkness. They can get pretty prideful over the fact that they have light. And look at those bad people over there. They're stumbling around in the darkness. Can you believe some of the things those people are doing over there in the dark? Sure glad I got the light. You know, I don't think Jesus gave us the light so that we could be prideful or judgmental towards other people. I like what Jim Dennison wrote. He said, Jesus called us the light of the world. Note the definite article indicating that we are the only light of the world. If you're holding the only flashlight in a dark room, then whose fault is the darkness? You're in this dark room. People can't see. you got the flashlight, but you're not shining. (coughs) Whose fault is the darkness? If more Christians acted more like Christ, how could our culture remain the same? He goes on to say, if Satan cannot get you to sin, then he will tempt you to feel superior to those who do. And such superiority is itself a sin. Our feeling of superiority will keep us from effectively helping other sinners turn to the Savior. And Denison is convinced that people will be persuaded to follow Jesus when they see our compassion. And I think he's right. So today, I want us to focus on living a life of compassion. If someone asked you to define the word compassion, how would you define it? 
One writer defined compassion this way. He said, compassion is a heartfelt response to the suffering of others that motivates me to help in Jesus' name. So when we go to the Bible, what's the Bible tell us about compassion? When you look at the Old Testament, there's over 100 verses that deal with compassion in the Old Testament. When you move to the New Testament, there's over 100 verses that deal with compassion and helping the less fortunate. So when we realize we have over 200 verses that focus on this topic of compassion, I think that should tell us that compassion is very close to the heart of God. It's very close to the heart of God. Every day we're faced with a choice. Will we ignore the needs around us, or will we respond with compassion to those in need? There's this famous passage in Matthew 25 where Jesus is teaching his followers about showing compassion to the less fortunate. Matthew 25, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. I think when we read this scripture, we sometimes rush by verse 34, but notice what that verse says. It says, the king will say, come you who are blessed by my father, and what? Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. If you stop reading right there, you'd have to say, wow, that is a pretty amazing reward. I wonder what these people did that led to such an amazing reward from the king. And then when you read further, you see this amazing reward was given to people who put their faith in action. They showed compassion to people in need. They fed the hungry. They showed hospitality. They gave clothing to those in need, and they visited the sick. And Jesus says, when you show compassion for the least of these, it's as if you're showing compassion to Jesus Christ himself. So please remember this. How you respond to the needs of others, that's a really good indicator of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Your response to people in need reveals the condition of your heart because when you serve them, you are serving Jesus. When you help people in need who could never pay you back, then you are being a blessing in their life. And when you allow God to use you to be a blessing in another person's life, the Bible says that God is going to bless you in return. So as followers of Jesus, I want to ask the question this morning, how can we shine the light with compassion? Let's not shine it the wrong way. Let's not annoy people. Let's not be irritating with how we do it. But let's shine the light in a way that honors Jesus Christ. How can we shine the light with compassion. I want to list four things. We're going to start with the letter A. A is appreciate God's compassion for me. Let's just think about this. We experience God's compassion throughout our lives, but many times we don't even notice it. We just take his compassion for granted. Verse one, or Psalm 145, verse 8, the Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. Notice it doesn't say that God is compassionate only when we deserve it. It doesn't say God is compassionate until you make him really angry. No, this is about God's character. God is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry. He's filled with unfailing love. That means that even when you are at your worst, God is still at his best. When you're at your worst, God's still at his best. He's still compassionate. He's still filled with unfailing love. Let's remember that the greatest act of compassion in the history of the world was when God sent his only son to die on the cross for our sins. He showed compassion to us in the fact that while we were still sinners, Jesus came to die on the cross for us. 
So if you ever find yourself struggling to show compassion to other people, then maybe you need to back up and ask yourself this question, do I really appreciate and have I experienced the compassion that God has shown me? Because I think that's where it starts. Once you realize how compassionate God has been to you, then you're more willing to show compassion to other people. God showed compassion to me when I didn't deserve it, so I need to be willing to show compassion to other people. Letter B stands for become aware of the needs around me. So how good are you at recognizing the needs that are around you? Do you see them or do you just walk by them? I read the testimony of a pastor in New York City. He said that when he first moved to New York City, his heart just broke when he saw people in need and when he saw people living on the streets. He was overwhelmed with the poverty and the brokenness that he saw. It impacted him emotionally. And part of his job was working with the homeless and with at-risk youth. He saw it every single day. But then he said that something began to happen in his heart. He saw the poverty day after day after day. But now instead of feeling compassion, he began to block it out of his mind. His feelings changed from compassion to becoming callous towards people. And his heart just became numb. And he said he no longer saw their humanity. He started feeling more irritation instead of compassion. So after listening to his story, has something like that ever happened to you? Maybe earlier in your life, you felt compassion for people in need, but then over time, your heart grew hard and callous. Maybe you tried to help somebody and they took advantage of you, so you said, yeah, I'm done with that. I'm not going to do that anymore. Let's be honest. Your life can get real busy. You really don't have time to get interrupted with people who are in need all the time. But you know what? Sometimes compassion demands that we get interrupted. Doesn't it? Sometimes compassion demands we get interrupted. It's always good for us to follow the example of Jesus. So let's look at his life. Jesus was filled with compassion. He was willing to be interrupted by people who needed him. The Bible tells us that one day Jesus had this long day of ministry. He wanted to go off with his disciples by themselves so they could get some rest. So he got into this boat with his disciples. They went away from the crowds. They went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is more of a lake. And as he went across the Sea of Galilee, guess what the people did? The crowds ran all the way around the lake to meet him on the other side. And he gets out of the boat, and there's this huge crowd waiting for him now. And he just wanted to get some rest. Mark 6, 34. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he said, What's a guy got to do to get a little rest? Just leave me alone. <laughs> Didn't say that, did it? So Jesus saw the huge crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Didn't that sound? Despite being tired, Jesus saw the need he let his plans get interrupted. So as followers of Jesus, I think we need to be willing to do the same thing. You've got your day all planned out. You don't need people interrupting you. But you know, there's times when compassion demands that we get interrupted. It demands it. Here's letter C. Commit to action steps. Let's remember that talk is cheap. We need to put our faith in action. Compassion isn't just a feeling. It needs to be an action that you and I take. James puts it so well in chapter 2. James 2, verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, well, goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? 
So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it's dead and useless. So let's get real practical with some action steps that we can take to show compassion to people. You know, some of you are real concrete and practical, and this is right in your wheelhouse. Your attitude is, well, just tell me what to do, and I'm ready. Let's go. Let's do it. <coughs> so here are just a few ideas that I think some, some ideas that our church can tackle, some things our church can do to show compassion. First, some of you remember us talking about a blood drive for our church. There's a shortage of blood. I'm sure you've heard about it. So as a church, we can say, oh, well, that's too bad. Let's sing another song, have another cup of coffee. Or we can say, you know, what? Let's try to do something about that problem. So this past week, we met some representatives from the Red Cross at our church building to discuss our church hosting a blood drive. And the good news is they like our building and they're more than eager to have us host a blood drive for them. The bad news is that they have a shortage of trained volunteers, so the soonest they can schedule with us is the month of May. But that's going to give us time to plan and advertise and recruit people because there's still a shortage. And they'd be doing more and more if they had more trained volunteers. Yep. So if you didn't hear that, you can give other places, you know, before me. And then again, you can help right here as our church tries to help with the shortage where people need blood. Or how about this idea? The COVID pandemic has had a major impact on so many areas of society. One major area of impact has been on people's mental health. Research is showing it's had a terrible negative impact on teenagers' mental health with increases in anxiety and depression. And it's not just teenagers who are affected. We see it a lot in adults as well. So what can we do as a church when we see people struggling in this area of mental health? Do we say, have a good day, stay warm and eat well? No, I think God wants us to put our faith in action. So God cares about our total being. That means he cares about our mental health. So our church is looking to host a seminar here on mental health so that people can find some hope and some encouragement. And you know, the last time I checked, I think the church is supposed to be all about offering hope to people, isn't it? Yeah. So let's offer hope the way the church is supposed to. We can host a mental health seminar, have a person presenting from a Christian worldview. We can offer hope and encouragement to parents who are saying, what do I do? I don't know what to do when my child's struggling right now. We can help teenagers. We can help adults. I think it's something our church can do. Here's another idea. The Basic Needs Thrift Store is located close to our church. We can show compassion by donating to help families in need. Basic Needs often gets requests from the schools for winter outerwear for children in need. So right now there's a need for winter clothing. We can donate gently used coats and snow pants, good quality gloves and mittens and new socks. With the gloves and mittens, they say please don't donate the super thin ones. They're looking for gloves that will really keep kids warm. We have a flyer on the back table if you need a reminder of the items that are needed. You can take your donations directly to the basic needs thrift store, or you can bring your items to church, and we can take them to the basic needs store for you. If you have questions on this, you can see Annette Fanari. Again, there's a flyer like this in the back. They have moved to uh, a location close to Ace Hardware, and I think that's a way for our church to say, you know what? We have people in our community who need this. What can we do to help? Annette said the schools are getting all sorts of requests right now. There's kids that can't go out at recess because they don't have the right winter clothing. And if one kid can't go out, the whole class can't go out. Okay? So if we can step in with some coats or snow pants or gloves or mittens, it's a way to show compassion and help people who need some help. What about individuals or families? What can they do to show compassion? Well, how about cards of compassion? Think about someone who might be going through a really hard time and drop them a card. Think about someone who might be lonely. Drop them a card or go visit them. What would happen if you set a goal of sending one card of compassion per week? Think how God could use you to offer encouragement 
to people. You can pray for that person and then drop them a card of encouragement. If you need an idea for your family, how about something like this? You know, in case you haven't noticed, we've had some really bitterly cold days lately. <laughs> there are people in need. What can we do to help them? I think this can be a teachable moment of compassion for your kids. Maybe you start with your family by thanking God that you have a bed and a warm place to stay when it's so cold outside. That's a blessing from God. But we have been blessed to be a blessing to others. So maybe it's time for Friday night supper, and instead of spending 30 or 40 bucks on a pizza or eating out, you decide you're going to stay home and simply have peanut butter sandwiches and mac and cheese for supper. Then Stan say something about denying yourself. <laughs> that should be a Friday night stand. Right? <laughs> that would save you 30 or 40 dollars, and you can give that money to a Christian group who's providing food and a warm place for. People who sleep <laughs> who are in need. What a teachable moment for your kids. They're reminded we have been blessed by God to be a blessing for others. Maybe you even read part of Matthew 25 to them. And you remind them of what Jesus said in verse 40. And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to the, one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Amen. And the beautiful thing is that if your kids grow up seeing compassion put in practice like that, guess what they start doing when they become adults? It just becomes natural for them. They say, you know what? I've been blessed to be a blessing. There's a person in need. I think I need to help. I think that's what God wants me to do. Oh, I mean, there's so many good things of ways we can shine the light of compassion. That we just think and let the Holy Spirit nudge us and, and put it into action. Dave Ramsey said, when action meets compassion, lives change. I think that's true. When action meets compassion, lives change. God wants us to put our faith in action. Here's the last thing, letter B. Develop a lifestyle of compassion. When you look at the life of Jesus, he didn't commit to an occasional act of compassion. Instead, his whole lifestyle is compassion. And he calls us to do the same. Philippians 2, don't be selfish, don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Verse 3 says, don't try to impress others. We talked about our heart motivation last week. We should never do an act of compassion to get an ego boost. You don't do a good deed so that others are going to brag about how good you are at helping others. If you're doing things from selfishness or to impress others, then it's really not a true act of compassion. The scripture says, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. So you're not going to be able to help every single person you need, but you can help some people. Let the Holy Spirit nudge you into action. Take an interest in other people. What do they need? And just remind yourself every day, I've been blessed to be a blessing. I've been blessed to be a blessing. As I prayed about how to end this message, it occurred to me that I should take time to say thank you. <laughs> you know, it's a beautiful thing when Christians shine the light through acts of compassion. So I want to thank you for your faithfulness in showing compassion to people who are in need year after year after year. I know many of you give of your time or you give of your finances to help people in need. So thank you for honoring God in this way. That is so important. Thank you. And thank you for allowing God to use you to shine the light. It's amazing to see the impact you can have when you make yourself available to God so that he can use you. So thank you for letting God use you. And then thank you for setting a good example for other people to follow. You know, as Christians in the church, we should be attracting people to Jesus. And when you faithfully show compassion to others, you're setting a good example. You're attracting people to Jesus. If I see that, I say, hey, I want to be a part of a church that does that. I think that's what other people say, too. I want to be a part of that. Because God wants us to put our faith in action. So I want to leave you with this scripture, Galatians 6. Let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up.
Therefore, whenever we have opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much that you are merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. Lord, thank you for your compassion. I pray that we will never take that for granted. And Lord, please lead us now to show compassion to people who are in need. Remind us again and again and again that we have been blessed to be a blessing. And then as we commit to doing acts of compassion, we pray that people will be attracted to Jesus. And they will see what an awesome God you are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.